everyone uh, for joining us for this very important conversation that we are having with our expert panel. Uh, my name is Paul Frimpong, I'm the Global Head of Membership with the ICC, uh, which are the organizers of this uh, virtual dialogue. And of course, for the benefit of those that are joining us for the first time, uh, the ICC is simply the Institute of Certified Chartered Economists. So we are one of the world's leading and foremost professional qualification program for economists. And we provide a certification that are structured in various curriculum that we have. And it is offered remotely and online. So irrespective of your location in the world, if you're looking to join a global body of economists, then of course, we will highly recommend the ICC to you. And what we do is beyond just certification, we uh, try as much as possible and as often we do, uh, creates a more knowledge sharing platform, which is what economy is supposed to do, to have conversation that borders around our economy. And so of course, it's in line with that, that today we're very privileged to have this very important session uh, on, on the future of multilateralism, uh, specifically focusing on multilateral development banks. So that is about the ICCE. We are membership based. So the first step is that you have to first register with the institutes. I will put the link in the chat box for everyone that has not visited us to check the website and see how you can be part of it. So we are a global community of economists. And so we, we provide a certification, but also create platform for learning and knowledge sharing, which is very key and go a long way to support your career as, as an economist. So whether you are aspiring to become an economist, you are working as an economist, or your current role requires that you have some knowledge in economics, and of course, we recommend the ICC to you to be a part of it. So we are will create just like other professional qualifications that we know uh, in the field of accounting, like the ACCA, like the CIMA, we have the CPA, uh, you have the CFA in finance. So we are ICC for economists. So that is how we will create uh, in terms of the membership and our structure. And so today we are very happy that all of you could join us. We are hoping that more people will join us and we begin the conversation. Uh, this session is recorded, so of course we'll make it available after this session on our website, so that you can also uh, rewatch and go through again the insight that we are going to receive here today. So we we'll go back to business now. Uh, with today, we are very privileged and very excited that we have the opportunity to interact with some uh, astute professionals. Uh, who, of course, in due time, I'll introduce, I'll read briefly their, their profile, so we know who they are, and of course, to uh, delve deeper into uh, the discussion for today, which is on the future of multilateralism, uh, boosting the investing capacity of multilateral development banks, MDB. So that is the session that we're going to have. And of course, this, this uh, session is born out of a report uh, by an expert panel for the G20, uh, which was launched uh, last year, the G20, I think, uh, uh, by the G20 in, in Indonesia. And now we have the G20 in India, of course. But this report was leading to the G20 uh, in 2022 uh, in Indonesia. So the report was put together by expert panel, uh, tasked to uh, independent review of multilateral development banks, uh, capital adequacy frameworks and also to reflect on the broad agreement among participants. And so uh, that is the basis for this conversation that we're gonna have. And to help us delve deeper into the conversation, we are very privileged, as I said earlier, to have these distinguished individuals who themselves were members of the expert panel put together by the G20 to uh, produce this uh, very report that we are going to have discussion on. So I will just briefly introduce our panel uh, uh, who are going to join us in, in this conversation. So first uh, is uh, Franny Lutia. So Franny uh, chaired this expert panel and currently is a member of the governing council of the ICCE. She's a senior partner uh, at Southbridge Group and the CEO of Southbridge Investments. Uh, and she, she has held leadership roles at the Trade and Development Bank, including as vice chair of the board and special advisor to the president, and also as the chief operating officer of TDB. Uh, she has had an illustrious career at the World Bank Group, where she was even as a vice president for seven years uh, during her tenure at the World Bank Group. 
The next to join us as well is Nancy Lee. Uh, Dr. Nancy Lee is a senior uh, policy fellow at the Center for Global Development, C CGD, and a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Previously, she was deputy CEO of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the MCC. And proud to MCC, uh, Dr. Lee was general manager and CEO of the Multilateral Investment Fund, MIF, at the Inter-American Development Bank, the private uh, the bank's laboratory for private sector-led development and a key impact investor in the region. The next to join us is Hans Peter Lankes or Langs, or maybe he will help me after to learn how to pronounce it, last, his last name well. So she is a visiting professor um, at the Grantham Institute at the London School of Economics and Political Science (LSE). He is a senior fellow at the LSE Oxford State Fragility Initiative and holds. Uh, roles with development finance institutions and impact funds, including senior roles at the IFC, International Finance Corporation, the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the IMF, as well as in the academia, as she is now a visiting uh, professor in practice at the LSC. He received his PhD from Harvard University and degree from uh, University of Freiburg and University de Grandbourg, which is in France, I think. The last but not the least will be uh, Betsy Nelson, uh, she has over 40 years working in private sector banking, uh, financial regulations and development banking, and currently uh, portfolio risk consulting and independent director roles across multiple sectors and of course, uh, multiple regions around the world. She spent 30 years at JP Morgan, uh, where she worked in both client relationship roles, risk management, and of course, responsible for the teams across the Europe, Middle East and Africa, EMEA region. So, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are very much privileged to have these distinguished individuals to join us for this conversation. Uh, based on the work that you've done, and as I read your profile, uh, we believe that you have uh, you know, more knowledge to share with us as we begin the conversation. Now, the conversation is going to be uh, in three parts. So the first part is that we're going to hear from our expert panel first, uh, because we begin with Dr. Franny. Uh, after Franny, we go to Dr. Nancy Lee, from here, we come to Hans Peter, and then of course we go to Betsy to give their also their perspective on the on the topic that we have at hand. And then I will come in with some uh, questions uh, to also try and you know broaden the conversation very much. And then last but not the least, we we'll welcome questions from all of you that have joined us. We want the whole conversation to be very interactive. Our, uh, our guests are very well prepared to to answer any question that you might have. So on the Zoom app, you can see there's a Q&A uh, button that we have. That is where you're gonna put all your questions. I will review all questions and read it out to our speakers uh, after my session. So first we hear from our speakers. Second, I'll bring some questions up and then I'll, I'll marry it up with the question that you participants are going to send. So please prepare your questions as we begin the conversations and send them through to us via the Q&A uh, uh, button on the Zoom app. So put in your question, I'll get it read out to our speakers. We were supposed to have the chairman of the, okay. Uh, okay, so we have Franny to speak. Okay, uh, Hans-Peter, Nancy, and then uh, Betsy. Okay, so after Franny, then we have Hans-Peter, and then we have uh, Nancy and then Betsy. So I think that will work for, for us, that's fine. So that is how we're going to go. So on these notes, uh, I will be uh, giving way to Dr. Franny, um, to give us uh, the, the, the first round of uh, uh, insight. And she chaired the expert panel that put together this report. Uh, I think with your permission, Chairman, if your permission, maybe after this conversation, I will make the link for the report available as well for, for everyone that has joined this conversation to also download and go through as I have, and so that they can also broaden their knowledge in the issues about MDB. So that will be done for, for, for all the participants as well. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Franny, please we'll take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you for inviting us to talk to uh, the network of economists on the work that we did as a panel. I think it's very appropriate that uh, an, an organization that is a chartered economist organization uh, uses its platform to discuss our report because it's really critical that economists understand the role of multilateral development banks so that they can better shape how those banks function in terms of the, the activities that they undertake in the various countries. And the network of economists that uh, ICCE is uh, aggregating in, in its work 
uh, provides that opportunity. So thank you for inviting us. Um, maybe a few quick words before I go into our panel. Um, we are living at a moment in the world uh, which is really a, a moment of crisis. We have, of course, just come through the COVID-19 crisis, which has destroyed a number of economies, has taken Africa, for example, back more than a decade in terms of what it was able to achieve uh, in terms of social and economic goals. So that is a, is a huge decade of loss for a continent that is already working very hard to move ahead. We are facing amongst the highest food, fertilizer, and energy prices. It's impacting particularly economies that are dependent on agriculture, either for export revenues, but even for livelihoods. And that is also a very unprecedented situation we are in. We have a huge challenge uh, where trade has been disrupted, first by COVID, and now because of the war in Ukraine. And the supply chain effects that are impacting economies are creating even more hardship than we would have anticipated before. And then, of course, the very unusual high inflationary situation that many economies are facing with very few tools that the central banks and other instruments available can be used to manage that level of, of high inflation. And this comes at a time where the world is also facing a massive climate and biodiversity crisis. I'm actually here in Gabon uh, for the One Forest Summit, where, where we are talking about these precise issues to see where the funding is going to come from to help the world meet the 1.5 degree centigrade target that we have set under the Paris Accord. And of course, for Africa and other regions of the world, the development agenda remains very critical and that requires financing as well. So the, the multi, I start with this because the multilateral development banks were created at a very similar moment in the history of the world. We had just come out of the Second World War. The economies of most countries were destroyed and uh, countries were poor. And they had to create a mechanism that supports the development, reconstruction and the rebuilding of the global economy, but also of the uh, country economies when most of the purses of the public sectors of those countries were very thin. So the, the, the idea that was put in place was an idea of trust and contingency in saying that we are going to come together to create the Bretton Woods institutions and the multilateral development banking system, and we'll do it on the basis of a promise, which we call callable capital. So you call it when you need it, and the markets trusted that commitment and came forward with the financing that we have now been enjoying for a number of decades through the multilateral development banks. So the question for our panel uh, was, now given this crisis that we have, uh, and given the history and the uniqueness of the multilateral development banks, what can be done by the multilateral development banks uh, that would not immediately require new capital, but could actually deliver huge results? So our panel was put together under the Italian presidency of the G20. And to give you an in, in indication of how important this subject was, that, re, that creation of our panel has been sustained now through three presidencies of the G20. Because we were launched under the Italian presidency. Our work was conducted and completed under the Indonesian G20 presidency. And we submitted our report and the response in terms of how the MDBs are responding to our recommendations are taking place under the Indian presidency of the G20. And I'm very happy to see a number of colleagues from the ICCE from India who have joined uh, this, uh, this uh, webinar because the, the, the role that India can play as a middle income country chairing the G20 is also very critical for some of the recommendations that we have. Uh, uh, put in our report. So very quickly, what did we do? Uh, we were a panel of 12 independent experts, which again is maybe something quite unique because usually you need people who are independent, but also who understand the multilateral development banks, who can bring perspectives from the private sector, but who have also worked in government and who can pull all of this information together and pair it up with research done by 
academics, think tanks, and other thought leaders uh, around the world. So we were very fortunate to have that in our panel. All those categories of expertise were there. And on top of that, we had also regional expertise because all the major regions of the world were represented in our panel. We got together and uh, we decided very early on that really we should start from basic principles. So we sort of, in a way, threw out most of the things that had already been said and done about MDBs and thought about it from first principles. And what we came out with then was a series of recommendations, which as Paul said, he will share in the chat so you can take a look at our report, but I'll just summarize the categories and then my colleagues on the panel are going to go deeper into the recommendations. The first thing we said is the reason why the multilateral development banks have been able to do so well in their historical relevance, but they're now being challenged to do more, that opportunity space can be opened up if we rethink the way risk is determined and set at the multilateral development banks. And that's usually a question that is driven by the shareholders, what they want the multilateral development banks to do and how much they, they push in terms of the expectations of the MDBs, the risk that they would like them to take and the opportunity space in where the financing for taking those risks is going to come from. So that's the first element that we looked at to see how is the risk being currently determined in the MDBs and where could they be room to actually shift the, the definition of, of certain parameters that determine risk and therefore giving an envelope or a bigger space in which the MDBs can play. And Hans Peter and my other colleagues on the panel uh, could go in more depth about that. The second thing we looked at was to say, these MDBs have been functioning now for multiple decades on this promise of callable capital, but they haven't actually utilized the full length and breadth of that opportunity. And therefore what could be done by building up on that uniqueness of callable capital uh, to do more? Because uh, callable capital is a feature quite unique to the MDBs, the traditional commercial and other banks have to have paid in capital, which they then use to invest or to lend and, and, and conduct the activities. But the MDBs have this unique feature where a very small portion of the capital that they need is actually paid in. But the, the rest that they have available is a form, in a form of callable capital, they haven't been able to use uh, in, in, in innovative ways, which in our report we recommend can be done. And again, I'll let my colleagues go deeper and explain what these precise recommendations we have there. So then the third piece was to say, let's say now you set risk right, you tap into the, the maximum potential of callable capital without risking losing the high ratings that the MDBs enjoy, like the AAA ratings, which did give them an advantage in the market of cheap capital. What's the next thing you could do? And there we have a whole range of innovations that we were able to uncover and, and uh, provide as recommendations. And Nancy will be able to go in more detail into the unique uh, nature of recommendations within that block of innovations. But they stretch from uh, different forms of capital, different ways of thinking about risk and risk mitigation, different ways of crowding in the private sector without uh, losing uh, or changing governance structures and so on. Then there is a big a player or stakeholder in this whole space, and these are the credit rating agencies, and they form them the fourth block of our recommendations. What the credit agencies say and do has a big impact on the way countries are able to be rated and go to the market, but likewise for all banks and, and, and the multilateral development banks as well. And we realize that the rating agencies actually didn't have all the information that they need or all the, the, the tools that they needed to best assess the, the risk in the multilateral development banks and therefore give the opportunity where the banks could do more. And therefore our work was also targeted in engaging with the great rating agencies, understanding how they look at the MDBs, but also bringing in our knowledge as a panel to bear on what could be a way to look at the MDBs and therefore better set the, the rating uh, levels that would give the advantage that we need uh, for this boost 
in the capacity of the MPBs to raise capital and to lend and invest more. And then finally, we had a category of questions around governance, particularly of data, uh, availability of and sharing of information and platforms for exchange. And uh, my colleague uh, Betsy is going to go in more detail into that because again, information asymmetries are what are causing the rating agencies not to give the proper assessment of, of risk from the MDBs because they don't have access to the data. But also the MDBs are not learning from each other because the information examples and ways in which they've tried and tested different uh, uh, solutions are not broadly shared and they have to repeat and redo in each MDB when they want to do the, uh, any innovation. So the whole area of governance of data, information and knowledge sharing and a platform for exchange was a key area of recommendations. So we issued our report, it was discussed by the finance ministers, it was warmly uh, uh, welcomed and supported and the shareholders uh, basically uh, engaged with the MDBs and, uh, and asked the MDBs to put together roadmaps or evolution roadmaps that show how they're going to be implementing the recommendations that were found in our report. Those roadmaps are going to be discussed in the upcoming spring meetings of the uh, World Bank and the IMF. And of course, other, other MDBs are on, it, on the same path of developing their own uh, roadmaps. And at the end of that, we will then know collectively what the MDBs can do to meet the challenge that we are currently facing in the world and step up to the need that the world has for financing at the pace and speed and depth and volume of the current challenge we're facing. I'll stop here because my colleagues, I think, can go in more depth. But Paul, I wanted to give that broad overview so that the economists and others who are on the network can then uh, have a better understanding of those underpinnings and then ask the proper questions either today on our panel, but also to their own uh, policymakers and private sector and others, including the MDBs in their ecosystem. Thank you for inviting us. I know that, as you said, you gave a broader perspective on the report, uh, what, what necessitated a report, and of course, uh, as you broadly mentioned, the areas that a report covers. So we thank you very much. So I will invite Hans Peter uh, to, to, to then give his perspective as well. And after him, we'll go to Nancy and of course, Betsy for also coming. So uh, Hans Peter, please, uh, you, are, you are open now. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. And Thank you, Franny, for, for this great uh, overview. It, it really situates uh, what we're doing in, in, in the broader picture. And, um, and uh, it, it, it's, it's given us sort of a leadership uh, for our panel that, that has made this so, so effective. Uh, and Paul, I really appreciate uh, uh, being here and being with the ICCE because as an economist, I, I can uh, really sympathize with what you have. And it would be great to know how to become a member of the yeah. ICCE. All right, that's um, I'll reach out. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. So now just um, to recapitulate uh, it's what Franny said, the point of departure for the panel was that there needs to be a big step up in investment for all the challenges that we're facing, that the lending by the multilateral development banks can be a crucial financing source for that investment. And that if you, that if you want to scale up lending considerably, you need to use your existing capital better you need more capital and you need to mobilize more capital from the private sector. The work of the panel was, uh, as you heard from Franny, was focused on the first of these, the better use of capital while preserving the AAA rating of the main uh, MDBs. But it should be understood that we will need all of the above if we want to have a chance of addressing the development and climate challenges that we face. So that's important because uh, in part the discussion uh, that, uh, that is taking place among shareholders and at the MDBs is sort of setting capital, more capital against more efficient use of capital. And that is, uh, that is unnecessary. In the end, we will need both. Um, and we must absolutely address the project side 
so, uh, and we mentioned that in our report, more finance is important, but more quality project pipeline is equally important. And that means improving the investment environment and providing hands-on support for project preparation and development. Now back to the risk-related recommendations of the panel. Um, as Franny said, <clears throat> that was sort of one block of our recommendations. And the panel's point there has always been that the World Bank and the MDBs must be financially prudent, um, but they shouldn't be more prudent than is necessary for a AAA rating and therefore end up wasting capital. It would be important and in a sense a no-brainer that the shareholders should specify the level of risk that they are willing to take. And that would then provide an anchor for the MDBs instead of putting the cart before the horse and being driven by the rating agencies. That in a nutshell is our recommendation number one. And our conclusion is that the MDBs can take more risk with the capital that they have. That means they can somewhat increase the leverage on their balance sheets without endangering their AAA credit ratings, partly because some of the risk appears to be overestimated and therefore attracting excessive capital charges. One big factor there is preferred credit treatment. The expected credit loss that is factored in by some of the MDBs and by the credit rating agencies, in particular by the credit rating agencies, is far higher than the payment record by the borrowing countries justifies. The MDBs, as you all know, have an outstanding um, <clears throat> performance record. Borrowing countries have, in the course of history, always ended up paying. And that is not reflected uh, sufficiently, and in fact, it's almost not reflected in some cases, in the way that the risk charges are calculated. Similarly, there is evidence that both the credit rating agencies and the MDBs themselves are conceptually wrong in the way they estimate concentration risk. Sovereign portfolios are highly concentrated. So um, the World Bank has uh, a few dozen uh, sovereign borrowers. The regional banks have even less. So if you go to the, the African Development Bank, I think it's 35 or so sovereign borrowers. And so those are very concentrated portfolios. But the credit rating agencies use the same model for what they call granularity adjustments that the Basel Committee prescribes. And that model is designed for atomistic portfolios, portfolios with a very large number of uh, uh, of risk exposures. And if you apply that to situations with only 25 or 30 sovereign borrowers, you end up with huge concentration risk penalties that are actually inappropriate, and that are conceptually inappropriate. A third reason um, that there might be more scope to take risk while preserving your AAA ratings is that there is $1.3 trillion worth of callable capital in the system that is essentially disregarded by MDB risk managers. There may be different ways to make better use of callable capital. One is to strengthen the, its value through more clarity about the processes, perhaps some modification to the processes, engaging with the credit rating agencies about the value of these commitments and so on. And at the probably unrealistic extreme, this could go as far as the shareholders of one international institution, the European Stability Mechanism, have gone, that was providing legally enforceable guarantees behind the callable capital. And then suddenly, you would have a huge amount of additional capital in the system. Uh, as it stands, <clears throat> the processes are too unclear, the commitments are too vague, to uh, weigh very heavily in the credit rating agency's assessments, and they weigh zero in the assessments of the MDBs themselves. Another approach is to recognize the fact that callable capital provides a safety net for bonds and reflect that in the way that MDB internal capital adequacy frameworks are calibrated. There is no need to manage to AAA on a standalone basis if callable capital provides a significant ratings uplift 
for bonds. Now, just taking these factors, meaning essentially the scope for increasing balance sheet leverage, the World Bank president said uh, just uh, about two weeks ago uh, that the bank may be able to increase its sustainable annual lending level by $6 billion, or about one quarter of the level of uh, pre the pre COVID level of sustainable lending. And that is before the reforms that Nancy will speak about next and that Betsy will be uh, talking about. But whatever the approach, it is hard for shareholders to have that conversation in the absence of data and more analysis. And our recommendation from the panel is not to rush to judgment at the spring meetings. The shareholders should, in our view, call on the MDBs to form a task force to agree on common terms of reference for assessing the scope for valuing callable capital of preferred creditor treatment and of other factors in the capital adequacy framework. And then they should report on progress at the annual meetings in the fall. And with that, over to Nancy. Thanks so much, Hans Peter, and thanks, Franny, and thanks, Paul. Um, I also am really uh, very pleased to be part of this conversation because I also um, uh, am an economist um, and would welcome uh, the opportunity to join this group. Uh, so I will focus on um, what the report calls financial innovations. Um, I would say at the outset that many of you who are familiar with markets, private markets, um, probably don't view all the, the things I'm about to describe as incredibly innovative because they are used very frequently in the commercial world. So part of what we are proposing is that these very well-established instruments be used uh, in the world of multilateral development banks for great effect. Um, the report focuses on two kinds of innovations, <clears throat> uh, some which would add to available capital apart from the question of general capital increases and the others that would free up existing capital uh, for additional lending. <clears throat> so there, and before I describe uh, several uh, particular um, proposals, I wanted to say that all of them share the following characteristics. First of all, they all work at the portfolio level rather than the transaction by transaction level. <clears throat> so the, their aim is to work at scale, in part to mobilize uh, private finance at the scale that um, uh, the, these institutions really uh, need to achieve. <clears throat> um, the second, as Hans Peter said, these are not substitutes for general capital increase, they rather complement um, a capital increase because it, it's it's much easier for shareholders to make the case for additional capital for these institutions if they can credibly argue that the existing capital is being used efficiently and of course any additional dollar uh, in a general capital increase would have that much more impact uh, if these recommendations were implemented <clears throat> and third all of these innovations share the following characteristics they do not require changes in MDB articles of agreement. They don't require a change in MDB governance structure or shareholding. Uh, they have already been piloted by one or more institutions and I would call out the African Development Bank in particular as a pioneer in these areas. And they allow the MDBs to concentrate on their comparative advantage which is really originating uh, strong STG investments. And, th and that's those were their criteria that the panel deployed in choosing which um, of the recommendations to <clears throat> include in the report. Um, if these decisions on these recommendations are quick taken quickly, the benefits uh, in terms of increased lending capacity can begin to flow in a year or two and they can be scaled over time. So um, the urgent uh, needs that Frandi um, was mentioning in the beginning um, really should be the context for which for, th for the shareholders to decide, the shareholders and management of the institutions to decide on these innovations. <clears throat> I will focus on three innovations 
uh, and the, the reason is that um, it's pretty clear that decisions on these particular innovations could be taken quickly, including this year, potentially even at the spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank, or at least um, uh, uh, in the first half of the year. Uh, so the three are hybrid capital. Uh, a second is a donor portfolio guarantee fund, and the third is an enhanced role for the multilateral investment guarantee agency, you know, which is part of the World Bank. <clears throat> so starting with hybrid capital, um, hybrid capital is a very scalable means of adding to available capital in ways that can be attractive to both shareholders and large-scale institutional investors that are interested in increasing the SDG share of their portfolio. As you know, hybrid capital instruments have uh, characteristics of both equity and bonds. Um, they are long-term instruments. They have coupons that can be suspended under certain circumstances, and they require uh, purchasers generally to hold the asset for a certain period of time. Credit rating agencies assign considerable equity value to these instruments in the commercial world. And they've clearly and publicly indicated their intention to assign such value in the world of multilateral development banks as well. Um, hybrid capital does not, do, does not confer voting rights to um, holders. Uh, so again, they would not affect MDB issuance. The African Development Bank has already received approval from its board to issue hybrid capital. And in fact, has just worked out an arrangement with the IMF that will allow IMF members to use their SDRs to purchase hybrid capital in the Africa Development Bank. And my understanding is that the issuance plans of the bank are quite ambitious and would be quite large in comparison to their existing capital from shareholders. <clears throat> so the, the African Development Bank has moved beyond that pilot phase. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's telling that if the African Development Bank can contemplate issuance of, of a very large magnitude in this very difficult time in a region with many low-income countries as well as middle-income countries, uh, that should give skeptics uh, some pause about the value and scalability of this asset. And uh, it, it is um, entirely conceivable that at the spring meetings, the developing committee or G20 could call on the World Bank to form a working group with the regional development banks to explore common hybrid uh, capital design features that would begin to create uh, an, an asset class um, that, that could be scaled across the system. So the second example is a donor portfolio guarantee fund. So this fund, um, uh, financed by interested donors would take risk at the portfolio level off uh, MDB balance sheets rather than transaction by transaction. Um, uh, there is already an, an example of such a fund in the International Financing Facility for Education. It's a very efficiently designed fund. The amount of paid in capital that donors uh, have to contribute to the fund is relatively small. They can su supplement that paid in capital with a contingent capital commitment should um, uh, arrears rise to a level that would require restoration of a certain threshold of paid in capital. Um, and donors can also add concessional finance uh, to make lending terms for certain activities very attractive. It's a very administratively efficient model because it does not require uh, origination of loans. These would be loans that would be on the portfolios of the banks. And it also doesn't require a complicated governance structure because the guarantee fund would not be approving these guarantees loan by loan, but rather at the portfolio level. <clears throat> it would be particularly useful for vulnerable countries or high emitting countries that are bumping up their country exposure limits in the multilateral development banks. <clears throat> and it's also well suited to expand lending headroom for countries that have their own well-developed climate and development investment plans, such as those uh, embodied in the climate, the country climate and development reports that the World Bank uh, is, is working on with partner countries, 
or the Just Energy Transition Plan. So these, these uh, investment plans could be deployed in um, uh, allocating uh, these, these donor resources. <clears throat> Uh, and perhaps some of the funding for these portfolio lever level guarantee funds could come from this very fragmented architecture we see for concessional climate finance spread over hundreds of trust funds and financial intermediary funds now under the umbrella of the, of the World Bank uh, group. So that is also a decision, a decision to start to design such a fund uh, and have donors work together with multilateral development banks to do it could, could be announced uh, uh, relatively quickly. And then finally, for the multilateral um, insurance guarantee fund at, at the World Bank. <clears throat> this is a very powerful asset uh, the bank has. <clears throat> uh, it has a global mandate and a diversified portfolio. It has political and non-honoring contract insurance products. It has a well-established uh, track record. Uh, it has excellent access to private reinsurers and in fact reinsures most of its portfolio. It has the ability to take on public and private exposure. And, and the authority would work not just with the uh, other parts of the World Bank, but with other MDBs as well. So currently, it works transaction by transaction <clears throat> um, on its own transactions or with other MDBs on transaction. Uh, and the collaboration um, is limited in practical terms um, by either actual or perceived competition between the MDBs on the one hand and uh, MEGA for shares of the same transaction. So the report recommends that it's time to move forward with an ambitious plan from MEGA to ensure MDB risk at the portfolio level, which would then free up MDB capital for additional lending. And this could be defined for certain kind, kinds of lending for, for example, adaptation uh, and um, <clears throat> mitigation. So that collaboration would be mutually beneficial. MEGA would benefit from the project origination strengths of the multilateral development banks that are on the ground uh, in every country, but the MDBs would benefit from offloading their portfolio risk using MEGA's advantages um, in insurance products and insurance markets, as well as MEGA's uh, global exposure. <clears throat> so th this is something that, again, that shareholders could encourage management to do, to task MEGA to develop a plan for these portfolio level uh, risk transfers accessible, not just by the World Bank, but by other um, MDBs. And the, the plan could have options for MEGA exposure size for the insurance products that are included and for the MDB lending portfolios that are eligible. So I hope by this brief presentation, I've given you a sense of things that um, are very doable in the near term. They just require uh, a certain commitment by <clears throat> both shareholders and manage management of the institution. And the faster those decisions are made to start this process, um, the quicker that the benefits can start to flow. Um, and then scale over time. So let me stop there and turn over to Betsy. Thank you, Nancy. And, and I, I also echo my thanks to my panel members, but also to Paul and the members of ICCE for joining us and for inviting us to be here today. The last two recommendations that we have in the report really relate to more how the credit agencies are involved, how the shareholders engage with them, and then really creating an enabling environment um, for better governance of the CAF and for more transparency. The key thing with the credit rating agencies, and it's a big factor, is the belief that the shareholders want these institutions in place and value them. Um, any small indication of, of weakness from any shareholder can actually result in rating agencies notching down the rating of a bank because they lack the shareholder support. So one of the first recommendations is we need the shareholders to better understand the rating agencies, engage with them, and to publicly and consistently 
um, identify and state the importance of the MDB network. I think there is a growing and clear fact that there's a need for these, these banks and to continue to do more, but, but the shareholders need to step up and be visible. Secondly, the recommendation um, calls for transparency of the rating of the rating agencies' methodologies. There are three key agencies. They have different methodologies, although there are similar themes in them. And the MDBs to maintain their AAA have to meet the lowest factor that would cause a downgrade, which means they're building up a conservatism in their capital management um, and therefore restricting their lending capacity. As Hans Pecher mentioned, the understating of PCT and the overstating of concentration means that the banks are holding more capital, either retaining it or not using it, and that that can be corrected. However, to achieve that, they need information and transparency, and the banks need to have a better understanding of what it is that they're, the, sorry, the shareholders need to have a better understanding of what is happening within the banks and their, their modeling. The thing that we called for in the report was actually for the MDBs um, to start working together to try and create a common benchmarking that they can publish to be able to share data and harmonize their, their rate CAF um, as much as the possible. They'll never be the same, but to at least start having common definitions, common understandings that would allow the agencies to see more clearly the read across. Um, we've also called for the statutory limits that have been set up. Again, Hans Peter referenced them. They are really particularly useless. They aren't risk weighted. Um, and given they're not risk weighted and they don't take into account any other additional type of capital that might be raised as Nancy discussed, they really will become a, a hard limit as the banks grow their activity as we hope they will from recommendations we've, we're making. Um, and lastly, on, on some of the aspects of um, the CRAs, we think that the MDBs can play a role in terms of leading the discussion with the rating agencies on how um, ESG assets are risk weighted. The MDBs have led a lot of the work that's been done on what are the standards for um, green bonds, social bonds, and they can help lead the aspect of the risks associated with them and potentially improve the risk weighting. A big gap that we have seen is the understanding of the boards uh, and their ability to interpret the CAFs of the banks. And this is because the composition of the boards are not made up of people that have the financial expertise and experience around managing capital aspects of an institution. So we've suggested um, that in order to have a better understanding, the boards should consider getting access to financial expertise or government should be thinking of appointing people, at least some people who have stronger expertise that allows them to really understand what the bank is telling them, how the bank's managing their capital. And without an understanding and without the consistency of some extent across the MDBs, it's very hard for the governments to understand what MDB really needs more capital and what is the actual utilization that's happening. The next thing was this aspect of some benchmarking. Um, we would like to see the MDBs come together and do this, as I mentioned. Um, but also we think that the um, transparency of information is important. The, the banks have created uh, a vehicle called GEMS. It's an emerging markets credit database. It is the only database in the world that's fully harmonized and brings together the data of some 20 MDBs. That data could be used to produce statistics, trends and information, particularly around defaults of the sovereign portfolios of which they're very few, and, able to, and that would enable the credit rating agencies to better assess that risk in terms of defaults. And it links back to the whole question of understanding PCT. The rating agencies told us they'd welcome this information, but the banks don't really have a vehicle to supply it other than through GEMS. The banks do have a plan to take GEMS into an independent platform to allow it to stand alone, to be consistent, to have continuity, and to have a team that really manage and develop reporting for the rating agencies, the MDBs themselves, and indeed some of the external investors that Nancy's looking at that we'd like to see more engaged to be able to understand the risk profiles of these institutions. So I think I'll stop there. Um, 
but a lot of more transparency, a lot more sharing will allow some of these developments to, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy and Hans Peter, and of course, Franny. So um, we're very much informed, lots about the reports. And so we'll be going into the questions and answer session. Uh, so I've got a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I think we have Jonathan Waters, uh, Emmanuel, and of course, Vicky from Indonesia, they've sent in questions. Uh, so I want to begin with Jonathan's question before I even start my question. So uh, Jonathan Waters' uh, question was, given that developed countries are not yet showing themselves interested in asking their legislators for new capital injections for MDBs. How reliable is it that they would ask those same legislators to approve capital injection to and a cause for you know, callable capital? How do the credit rating agencies view that reliability? So that's a question that uh, Jonathan Water is asking uh, about the fact that developed countries are not showing you know, much interest in asking the legislators to inject more capital into MDB. So how uh, reliable is that they will ask those same legislators to approve capital injection to earn a cause for uh, collateral capital. So that's the question. So any of you want to take this up? I'm happy to take that, okay. uh, Paul. <clears throat> Yeah, well, it's it's a good question, but callable callable capital commitment in budgetary terms is not the same as a capital increase. And um, in fact, we we had we commissioned uh, the panel commissioned a, a sort of <clears throat> you know a study uh, was a bit back on the of the envelope, therefore we didn't uh, publish it, uh, but that uh, it shows uh, the orders of magnitude that we're talking about, and there the risk of a call on callable capital is some 10 standard deviations. It's, it's an absolutely nano risk. Uh, and in, the, in addition, there are steps that would, that, that uh, management, uh, the, the MDBs would be able to take when uh, such a scenario presents itself that would make it uh, unnecessary to call. So just to say, um, whatever the precise, and we, our recommendation is that each MDB should do that calculation themselves and present their shareholders with it, uh, it is very likely to be a, a very, very small probability type event. And in, in budgetary terms, in most countries, uh, low probability events uh, don't need to be budgeted in the same way. So it's really all a question about is how credible is it when the, when the time comes that a country is actually going to make that money available. And the rating agencies have, uh, you know, they have thought about this issue. There is actually a note by Fitch from last November or December, which goes in great detail uh, over that. We, the panel, uh, we looked at the processes we, we actually received from many of the shareholders, a, a detailed processes, which, which, you know, interestingly, nobody really knows. <laughs> and when you look into those processes, you find out that every country has their own process. And there are some countries which have a very, very solid process, um, which gives you a lot of confidence that a, a call would be answered very quickly. And you have other countries where it is somewhat vague. So the, the point is, there is scope to improve the, um, the just simply through the transparency, through the, uh, through, through being clearer about what uh, would happen and what countries mean with a call, with a call, what it means under their legislation. There is scope to improve the perceived value of callable capital. And the rating agencies, um, and I'm, I'm referring to that Fitch report, but the others have told us uh, in, in, in so many sessions, uh, and they would very much appreciate that. So the rating agencies themselves have been supporting the, the, the panel's call for a forum in which shareholders and rating agencies can discuss these things and the rating agencies can get a better picture of the, of the value of, of shareholder support. So that's, that's kind of my, my broad uh, uh, recommendation, uh, my, my broad response to Johnson's uh, message there. Okay, sure. Uh, does anyone want to comment on that? So I should move on to the next question. Okay, Dr. Frani, you are muted. If you can unmute, so please. Okay, it's good. All right. Okay. Okay. 
That's fine. So I'll, I'll ask the next question. So my question is, um, uh, can MDBs lend more with the existing capital or do they need more capital from their country shareholders? So that's the question. Can they lend more with their, with their existing capital or they need more capital injection uh, from their uh, uh, lending shareholders, yeah, their country shareholders, as a question. Shall I take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, there's no question on, even if you read the rating agency's reports that their reaction to our report, they clearly state that there is additional capacity on the existing rating processes on existing capital. So there is still room. Um, and a lot of the recommendations we make about managing risk, recycling capital means that existing capital can be used even more over time. Some banks, unless the rating agencies change their methodologies, and given that there are triggers that they might get close to one trigger in one agency, could lead them to ask for more capital. If there's rapid growth and alternative capital can't be found, there will have to be capital calls. But we believe that there's actually substantial capacity. The two of the rating agencies came out very clearly stating there is considerable capacity with existing capital. This is from Emmanuel. Emmanuel is an economist based in Ghana. So he's saying that the global financial architecture is skewed you know, against global South countries. So he's asking how can MDBs be mobilized to change this narrative? So you said a global financial architecture is skewed against global South countries. So how can MDBs mobilize, you know, to change this narrative? So that's the question is a bit more uh, in that. So any one of you want to take that? Perhaps I could jump in on that one. Um, okay. You know, we were focused mostly on uh, using capital more efficiently as we've described. Um, but, but it's really, um, uh, uh, you have to make the, the connection then very quickly to how that uh, additional lending capacity is used. Um, and um, if you're um, deploying instruments at the portfolio level, then um, you can, um, create the capacity for the country to define very clearly um, at a, at a uh, broad sectoral level, let's say, um, what its investment priorities are. So one of the virtues of these, of the, at least the financial innovations is that if you're taking, if you're transferring risk at the portfolio level or you're issuing, uh, um, uh, uh, guarantees, um, that can be defined in such a way that it boosts the capacity of a country to um, make public investments or to mobilize private finance for its investment strategy. So you can combine these port portfolio level risk transfers with country programs um, Again, he's defined by um, climate change and development research, I mean, uh, reports or um, just energy transition plans or the plans, um, the, the climate plans that are, that are developed with under the UN process with the portfolio guarantees. So um, uh, the, the, the important point is that when you, you start deciding how to deploy these um, risk transfer programs, that the country's uh, strategies should um, define the kind of portfolio that you want to um, uh, um, link to these uh, risk transfers. So I think it's very much the case that um, the this this additional capital efficiency should also be linked to giving the country um, the uh, agency with respect to defining what kinds of um, uh, lending to, should be done um, as these risk transfers um, occur. So I think that really should, it was not part of the mandate of our panel, but it it's very much. Um, uh, consistent with 
um, with trying to work at scale at the portfolio level, uh, including mobilizing private finance at scale. Paul, can I add something there? Yes, please. So what? So one big way in which the system is skewed is uh, in how it treats risks and how regulators treat risk on on um, bank and other financial institutions balance sheets. So how is Basel treating uh, certain types of risk? Uh, how is the um, in the EU the Solvency II uh, uh, regulation for, uh, for for institutional investors? Uh, how is that treating certain types of risk? And the so the MDBs basically have uh, you know two ways. One one is by helping change these risks in country. Uh, so to to lower uh, to lower the actual risks or the risk perceptions uh, and make it easier for uh, say commercial banks to uh, to engage or for insurance companies to provide uh, funds. Um, now that's kind of an indirect way of dealing with it, but it is one, you know, through blending or through just simply the umbrella of um, A, B loans, syndications, umbrellas or others. It's, it's, it's the most practical way of dealing with it. But there's the, the bigger way is, um, is essentially to lobby uh, the regulators to uh, make changes. And there has been some work together with the IMF, for instance, a few years ago to change the risk weights for uh, trade finance. That was, there was some progress made um, but there has to be uh, much more because uh, the, these regulations at the global, the Basel level, are done with uh, with advanced country uh, parameters in mind, and uh, and disregarding the liquidity and risk situation uh, of financial instruments in the global south, and that's kind of systematically uh, rationing out, if you want, uh, funding for the global south. Um, so there, there has to be um, a, a lobbying, there has to be a sustained agenda, and the MDBs can help with their voices, but this has to come more from um, the, the um, you know, the finance ministries and, and other participants. Okay, sure, thank you very much. Still on, on the risk, uh, Hans, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you again on the risk that you mentioned. So uh, the question here is, um, in the context of developing emerging markets, were there any unique or peculiar risk patterns that were identified that we believe the MDBs can help uh, uh, to de-risk it as it were, I mean, uh, for, for other, you know, to invite other, you know, form of investment to these uh, emerging markets. Were there any peculiar uh, uh, risk that were identified that you recommend, I mean, in terms of what MDBs can do in terms of, in terms of the risking all of these in, in emerging markets? Yeah. Um. Did you want me? Because in yes. principle, I'm going to I'm going to kick this over to <laughs> to other fellow candidates. But the the basic thing is the MDBs are in a good position to take on risks. They're supposed to, they they were created to take risks. In the panel's view, they take too few risks. They can take more, and those can be um, you know fairly general, and they can be very specific risks. General in the sense of of uh, helping through policy advice. Um, but also through through their uh, their funding, um, uh, the, the the aura that they have, you know, in in, in terms of co lending with uh, the MDBs, uh, helping reduce risk perceptions. Um, but it can be also very specific. And key risks are foreign exchange risks, uh, or or the early sort of construction risks and and projects. You can you can then design ways of of helping private capital come along you. For instance, if the MDBs take the first, uh, the, the, the construction phase risk and then hand over an asset like, like uh, with one of the methods that Nancy has, has mentioned, uh, hand those assets over to, to uh, uh, investors who, who then have an appetite for this, uh, for the lower risk uh, that comes over time. Uh, so there are there are detailed ways and there are more general ways that MDBs can definitely uh, contribute to tackling those risks. Okay. I think if I can, maybe I'll chip in a little bit here. I think one of the challenges of many of the ideas of risk transfer of hybrid capital of these is that the sovereign loan portfolios, which is a lot of the global south lending, are actually at a relatively, in fact, very thin and subsidized margin. 
So when you start trying to use other tools to manage the risk, there usually isn't the economics within the transactions or portfolios to allow the banks to actually push the risk out to private sector. So some of the challenges about Global South is everybody's going to have some sort of limit internally as to their appetite for them, partially driven by the rating agency structure and concentration risk, but the economics of these vehicles cost are, are high. So to make them work, you're going to have to see either more donor money, more concessional funds being made available that allow these transactions to take place. Okay, all right, so thank you very much, uh, Betsy, for that. Uh, so um, a question is from John. Uh, John is asking, given the, the current global conditions, which sectors would be more or should be considered priority sectors for, I'm sure, MDB investors? I mean, were there any uh, sort of, uh, you know, sector specific, you know, recommendation or it was just, uh, so that's a question basically. So any of you can take it up um, on this, yeah. This is one for Franny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the question. So it's asking, uh, were there any, uh, you know, particular sectors, whether it's sectors that were recommended to be a priority sector for MDBs uh, are going forward. Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, so our panel by, by, uh, by our terms of reference, but also by our choice did not pick any sectors because that was not part of our work. We were looking at the overall role of MDBs in financing development needs, but also the new challenges related to climate and biodiversity risks that the world is facing. So we didn't pick and choose any sectors. However, when you look at our recommendations as a group, they have maybe bigger implications for some sectors than others. And some of the lessons that we bring in in our examples that are presented in the report come from a different array of sectors. So that's, I think, what I can say in summary, but we were not mandated to pick and choose or recommend any sectoral priorities. Okay, thank you very much, Franny. Uh, so there's a question that was asked by Frederick. I think uh, Betsy answered probably, but I would like to read it out for what we can get you know, uh, more insight on that. So uh, he was asking uh, about uh, the likelihood of MDBs agreeing to collaborate you know, as deeply as the panel recommend. I think even Hans Peter mentioned about task force that needs to be uh, put together by the MDBs to assess uh, how they go about. So uh, Frederick is asking, uh, is, it, is it feasible that, is it likely that we're gonna see MDBs agreeing to collaborate um, as, as, as you, you recommended? Uh, and politically, you know, is it feasible? Of course, we know uh, uh, politics come to play here. So that's the question that Frederick is asking. Uh, yeah. uh, if it's feasible to see, I mean, MDBs uh, agree to collaborate, you know, as, as was recommended by, by, by the panel. Yeah. I partially answered it, so I'll, yeah. I'll kick off. I think, from my view, the banks have already done this in a number of areas. When it comes to things, what are green bonds? What is a syndicated loan? What is mobilization? Those areas that are more publicly available and more transparent, they have come together and done it. I think there's a view that the capital adequacy framework, the risk profiles of the portfolios is more a sense of confidential information and potentially more sensitive to their ratings. It needs the CFO networks and the CRO networks to come together and agree to start trying to get some sense of harmonized definitions. It doesn't need to be public. It needs to be done and available to the shareholders and to their management. So they can do it. It just needs to be a priority. And that I believe personally is gonna take shareholder pressure. If I could add, add just a little bit, um to what Bessie said, um, the, the institutions have an interest in um, developing uh, assets together that are um, similar and uh, scalable and very understandable to investors. Um, so for that reason, as um, uh, they move forward in consideration of these various risk transfer operations, the issuance of hybrid capital, it really makes a, a lot of sense for them to talk to each other, partly to benefit from the experience of banks that are pioneering, such as the African Development Bank, 
but also to um, uh, create um, asset classes that are attractive to investors uh, at scale. So um, they have um, they have that uh, common interest. It is certainly important to hear the voice of shareholders on this on this uh, issue because um, shareholders, of course, are on the boards of all of these institutions, and they want um, to maximize the, the financial gains of these uh, kinds of um, actions. So I think that the institutions, the management of the institutions have to understand that if they want to mobilize, let's say, private finance at scale, as they're expected to do, and as many are criticizing their performance um, uh, so far, then uh, it really makes sense for them uh, to um, work together. So you have to have a balance between the institutions that are pioneering and you don't wanna hold them back and waiting, waiting for everyone to move forward. On the other hand, um, you wanna have these conversations across institutions to benefit from that experience and to, um, uh, um, offer um, opportunities for private investors that are, are similar so that they can be scaled. More questions, please use the Q&A button before we take our last comment, uh, comment from our, our panel. So this one is, 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 uh, is going to Betsy. So the person is, is asking if you will give more, you know, clarity on the information uh, issue about transparency and information as the policy recommendation that was 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 you mentioned. So the person wants more uh, clarity on that. Uh, so you can uh, briefly touch on that in terms of transparency and information. Yeah. I'm not fully sure I understood the question, but in terms of what data and transparency we think is needed, the GEMS database has been established and and worked and they have done working together, the MDBs have actually come together and created a harmonized database. That database shows portfolio performance in markets across the world, the default rates, the recovery rates, um, the overall structure across investments in different sectors and performance in different sectors. GEMS currently publishes a very high level report, but the transparency is limited to that high level report. The MDBs have a plan and they've had it for years to make GEMS into an independent entity and independently managed with them as obviously involved because it's their data. Um, but to be able to have commitment from MDBs to provide the data, to be able to take that data and create better statistics, more tailored statistics for different audiences and, and make that available either as a public good or to the extent it will be used by a firm to create a vehicle and they'll make money, they can pay to use the data. That whole aspect of getting the information out and the key driver of this information is that the default rates, the recovery are, are low, but the recovery rates are high. So if you know that you actually don't ultimately lose money in, in investing in these portfolios, more investors will come in and accept a lower return. So that's a key part of the transparency. The other part of transparency is that the boards really don't understand what the MDBs are doing in their CAFs. And it's simply because it's a very technical field. It, it leverages the Basel framework, which is complex and very convoluted in some ways. So the more clarity, consistency, and transparency the boards can have across the MDBs, um, it's easier for the governments and the authorities to actually judge. So a single group of people in one government generally looks across all the MBBs and they get different information, different models, different terminology. And it's very hard to be able to compare it. And so it's very hard for the governments to judge who really needs the capital, who's really using their capital well. And that's the other aspect of the transparency um, and cooperation the MBBs have to make to try and, and help, help others help them. I'll mm. stop there. Maybe two, two quick points, Paul, on that. Yes. Um, the first aspect of transparency is already determined because for all the sovereign loans, that information can be aggregated from public sources. 
So really, uh, the, the, the issue is more a question of time, and therefore there should be no reason why the MDB should not uh, make that information available, because if you can ac actually collect it from public sources. So, so that's the first aspect. And then the second one, and, and this is really something that we in our panel did that has never been done before, uh, and, and Nancy and Hans Peter were leading that piece of work, was to actually come with a common vocabulary and terminology for the things that are being said at the MDBs that feature into these capital adequacy frameworks and other aspects that can now be available for shareholders and others to look at. And one product that we're very proud of uh, and the secretariat that we had was particularly helpful in that is what we created what is called the shareholders guide to the MDBs. So it's like a handbook and you know, economists love handbooks and I would really encourage the economists on the network, the ICCE network to think about it in those terms. What kind of ways could we contribute to a common vocabulary around development issues, around the role of MDBs that would enhance this kind of common handbooks, manuals or tools that enhance the knowledge of everybody around how the MDBs work, because that's also an aspect of transparency. Right, thank you very much. So I'm um, reading the last question from uh, Samuel. So I want to find out if MDBs have a strict mechanism to monitor and control how the loans offered to developing countries are utilized. So that's a question. So it's asking if MDBs have you know, strict mechanism to monitor and control how the loans offered to developing economies are utilized. So that's the question. Anyone? Um, I guess most of us here have worked for MDBs, so maybe we can answer that question. Yes, MDBs do have a mechanism for monitoring the, where their funds go and for what purpose they're used, but also looking at the implementation arrangements around their projects. And this is done by a large number of staff who actually travel to supervise uh, the investments made by the MDBs and uh, working in partnership with countries, but also more and more now in the reporting mechanisms that are in place for countries to report on how they're, they're using the funds. And maybe the last element, which comes from the digital capabilities, most of this information is currently online. So most MDBs have put that information online and you can go and Google a project in a given country and see almost all the information about it. So from that point of view, I think the transparency of uh, investments and supervision of those investments is quite high. The, the exception will be the non-sovereign loans because those are governed by a series of documents that require confidentiality uh, because some of the information could move markets, for example, and therefore those are not publicized. So the IFC and the private sector arms of MDBs may not publish all the information, but for public sector, th those should be available. Sure. Uh, any comments from anyone on this question on how MDBs uh, you know, monitor uh, the, the loans that they give? I just, I'd make an observation. The MDBs yeah. have to measure the impact of their investments. So as Franny indicated, they go and they actually check them, but, but to, whether it's ESG matters, they all have some aspect of what the investment's supposed to achieve. And they are accountable to the world because it's published that they actually are achieving this impact. Um, and a number of, of different institutions like Transparency um, International created an index about the impact that the banks are having. So they, there have been pressures to indicate what's happening. Secondly, from a governance aspect, the banks are very serious about corruption and very careful about where the funds are dispersed. So in certain cases, they actually disperse not to the contractor himself, but to the suppliers who sell the goods to, to insure. So, so they, those are key tenants of any MDB project and, and are generally very rigorously followed. All right, so sure. thank you very much. Uh, all too soon we are coming to the end of the session uh, for today. So I'll take last comments from our panel. And then, so I'll start from Hans, Peter, from him, I'll come to Betsy and then Nancy before Franny uh, comes in. Yeah. So Hans, Peter, maybe your last uh, remarks. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> thank you, Paul, for the opportunity. I just uh, uh, I just wrote a, a reply to one comment by Jonathan uh, in in the chat, uh, which was about you know what's actually the reception by shareholders, uh, and um, you know don't need to repeat that. But uh, our sense is that generally speaking, there is there continues to be uh, quite strong support from most shareholders for um, at least uh, uh, many of the recommendations. Uh, and there is a willingness to uh, consider even the more tricky ones like the one on callable capital. Uh, and we see that reflected, for instance, in the G20 um, finance minister statement from last Friday. Uh, please, you have to unmute. Yeah. Sorry, I think there's a great opportunity for the MDBs to actually um, step up and, and really take firm action. I think if they don't start working together um, and creating some transparency and creating more harmony of information, I think they'll continue to be handicapped. And without doing it, they can't help the rating agencies do even more work on fine tuning their own approach. So I think that the MDBs have a big role now to, to really step up and make this happen. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, yes. Uh, yeah, let me make just two last points. The, the first is, uh, as Hans-Peter said, um, the receptivity to these um, uh, recommendations is growing now rather, uh, um, rather than um, uh, shrinking. Uh, I think because shareholders are understanding that um, this is not uh, a way to avoid any consideration of additional capital, but rather a way to strengthen the case for additional capital by um, uh, being able to argue to share to sources of this capital, which are after all taxpayers and legislatures, um, that uh, existing capital is being used more efficiently. Um, and uh, that they're, the MDBs are responding uh, to these urgent needs that Franny was talking about. And we've seen that with the World Bank's um, public statements regarding increasing their lending in the near future uh, without actually even uh, pursuing all of these reforms. That's number one. And number two, these institutions um, really uh, are, are being criticized now, I think, um, based on their performance in mobilizing private uh, investment at scale, even in an environment where many investors are seeking to increase the, the SDG shares of their portfolios. And these recommendations really do offer a way um, to engage those investors and give them investment opportunities at scale. So um, it's not simply a question of increasing the lending of the MDBs themselves, but rather um, providing uh, larger opportunities for uh, private investors to either uh, co-finance or to take uh, some of the risk of the um, MDB portfolios. So, yes, Rani. Yes, thank you, Paul. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that uh, the MDBs are unique institutions that have, are the most efficient form of using public resources to leverage liquidity in the markets and bring cheap capital for development purposes. If they didn't exist, we would have to create them. But now they're being asked to step up to the plate and do more because the world requires more. And it's our hope that the recommendations in our report, particularly because of the, in, the way in which they've been received by the shareholders, will be implemented and that these roadmaps that the MDBs are developing would pave the way for how, for how the MDBs can really step up to the plate and do what is required of them and what they are uniquely capable of doing. So we thank you very much for inviting us to share our ideas and uh, encouraging all the economists out there to play around with our report, query it, send more questions, but more importantly, use economic knowledge to even further the arguments that we are making in, in our report. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Franny. Uh, thank you, Hans Peter, Betsy, Nelson, and Nancy Lee. We are so much appreciative of your time uh, that you shared with us today. Uh, once again, this 
session has been recorded. We'll make it available on our YouTube channel uh, for, for further viewing. Uh, so those who join us online from wherever you join us from, we say a big thank you. This has been possible and brought to you by the ICCE. Uh, in the coming days, of course, you'll get some couple of emails from us regarding the ICC program, how can we be a part of it. And I will take on the, the, the invitation from Hans Peter and Nancy Lee. I will share more information about the ICC to you on how you can be a part of what we are doing. We're very much uh, grateful to uh, have you on board as well and some of our projects and our programs. So thank you very much again, and we hope to come your way soon. Great, yet Sarada insightful session. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Take care.